Welcome to the first episode of The Han on Fire, a YouTube channel and podcast featuring education, commentary, and conversation with Dr. John DeHaan and some of his colleagues and friends. The Han on Fire is brought to you by Firewise Learning Academy. I'm Tim Davis, the voice of Firewise Learning Academy and your host. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. And don't forget to ring the bell to get notifications of new uploads to the channel. It seems only right that we take this first episode to get to know who Dr. John DeHaan is. Join me in a conversation learning just that. Dahan on Fire contains discussion and video not suitable for all audiences. Viewer and listener discretion is advised. So Dr. Dahan, it's really exciting to be starting this uh, YouTube channel and uh, it's only appropriate for us to start with this first episode getting to know you a little bit. So as I said before, welcome to your own channel. Well, thanks for the invitation. Uh, so, Dr. DeHaan, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, about your childhood. Where do you come from? Well, I'm a native of Chicago. I proudly claim uh, heritage on the south side. That's the White Sox end of uh, the city. So um, we haven't had a lot to celebrate in that way for, for many, many years. But uh, public schools there, and then uh, I ended up at the University of Illinois at Chicago Circle, uh, which was the... Chicago branch of the University of Illinois uh, main campus that was in uh, it's in Champaign Urbana, Cal uh, Illinois, and uh, I wanted to be a scientist um, from the time I was eight or nine. I wanted to you know study physics and and that's what I did through science fair projects and things like that, and then got into I built an uh, electron accelerator in high school. Um, and uh, it's my science fair project, and that won some prizes and things like that. But uh, that's what that's what I thought I was gonna gonna do. And we didn't live too far from Argonne National Laboratory, and so uh, that seemed straightforward. And I st I started in at Illinois as a bachelor of science candidate in physics. And after about two years, I realized, Abe, you know, real world physics wasn't much fun, and it involved a lot of math that uh, I was kind of losing track of. And uh, I thought, eh, maybe, maybe this was a mistake. And somehow I ended up in a introduction to criminal law course. And of course, everybody else in the class was a criminal justice major. And they looked at me and they said, what are you doing here? You're a scientist. You need to hang around and take the next, the, the next session. And I said, why, who is it? And, and they said, well, it's retired head of the Illinois State Crime Lab. And uh, he's a he's a scientist, so I stayed over and sat in on his class. It was Professor Joe Nickel, who uh, had been a criminalist since 1947, and had worked in all kinds of areas. And uh, he and I struck it off, and I realized that you know, forensic science or criminalistics uh, had a lot more interesting puzzles, and they were within my range of knowledge and, and skills, and, and uh, each one varied. And so I found out then that I, it was too late for me to change majors, uh, that as a Bachelor of Science candidate at Illinois in, in physics, that's what you got was physics. And it would have taken me an extra year to make up all the variables and stuff like that. So I uh, ended up sticking with uh, physics. I ended up with a a bachelor's degree in physics and uh, a minor in criminal justice or criminalistics since that constituted most of the criminal justice program at that time and um, launched myself out into the world. Uh, three months later, I had a job in California as a criminalist for the uh, Alameda County Sheriff's Department and that was 1970. Oh, well, that's really interesting. So it almost seems that uh, the job picked you instead of you picking the job. Yeah, in many respects, that's that's true. I was you know feeling kind of kind of down about well, pure physics research physics wasn't as much fun uh, as um, I thought it was going to be, and uh, the challenges. You know, I was a undergraduate research assistant on a high energy particle uh, project at Argonne for two years. And uh, at the end of it, there was a, a, a paper that sort of half proved the existence of what was then known as uh, resonance particles, uh, because they didn't understand at that point how, how particles actually worked. And uh, 
I thought, well, this seems like a colossal waste of time and money that, uh, you know, there aren't three dozen people in the world who care whether there's an S star resonance particle. And that's when I started hunting around and, and uh, I looked at history and that wasn't terribly exciting. And uh, just by luck, happened to meet Joe Nickel and, and I, was, I was hooked. He had, a, he had a degree in, his bachelor's degree was chemistry, his master's degree was physics. So he certainly encouraged a lot of hands-on involvement right from the outset. And how old were you when you met him? I was 21. 21. Actually, I was 20. I graduated when I was 21. So you're 21 when you graduate and then you launch into, you begin this career. What was the, uh, well, what was it like back then? Well, um, there wasn't a lot of training. <laughs> uh, I ended up in a, a, well, what we consider today a generalist laboratory. So there were, what, four or five of us uh, on the bench serving a large uh, population county in Northern California. And um, each of us were kind of assigned by our background uh, as to a particular area that we could function in. But as a general rule, we had to do pretty much everything that came in. And of course, a lot of it was uh, dope analysis, seizures, and um, that involved learning a lot of chemistry. But because of my physics background, my boss said, well, gee, you know about x-rays and, and optics and the spectrum and stuff like that, you can be the instrumentation guy. And um, so they kind of pushed me into the instrumentation lab and said, here, analyze all this stuff. And uh, there's the, the manual for the, for, the, <laughs> for the machine. Don't break it. And I said, okay. So that's, that's where I spent probably 80% of my time and uh, got to do all kinds of cases and crime scenes and, and, uh, things like that, but there wasn't a lot of training. And if just a few years ago, I was supposed to appear in a high profile uh, bombing case in uh, Washington, D uh, sorry, state of Washington. And uh, they, they did the voir dire, my qualifications over the phone uh, for a variety of reasons. And uh, the prosecutor, I was supposed to appear for the defense, so the prosecutor said, well, I have your CV here in front of me, and I thought, oh, here we go, 50 pages of questions. So, well, you don't seem to have had much in the way of formal training in bombs and explosives. I said, no, that's true, not a lot of formal training, and he caught the gist of that and said, well, how long have you been doing bomb and explosives cases? I said, my first bomb case was 1972. Oh, <laughs> and then he and I said, and my turf included Berkeley. We got a lot of practice in the 1970s. And uh, by the time there was training available, I was expected to give it, not take it. So um, he decided that maybe, maybe I was qualified to offer an opinion. He didn't challenge. He didn't ask any more questions about, gee, you have the experience? So uh, that was, that was kind of neat. But it, because of the physics, of course, I was extremely well suited to get involved in fire and explosions because what are they but the energy dynamic events uh, and understanding heat transfer and buoyancy and, and um, uh, inertia and things like that, vapor density and all the stuff that we rely on for understanding fires and explosions. Um, I already had that sort of in pocket and uh, it, it worked out really well for well, now we're pushing uh, 49 years as a criminalist. So uh, how did the shift or when did the shift begin to really focus on fire and explosion? Was there a particular case or was it, uh, as you said, your, your, your unique training that you were bringing to it and the, and the need to start establishing training or, or what was understood as norms? How, how did that become a focus away from uh, the drugs and the other things? Well, that was a, 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 lucky, a lucky break. I was eventually recruited by the, well, the system was maybe two years old, but the uh, relatively new California State uh, Crime Lab system uh, was being uh, put in place, and there was a number of new laboratories. But um, they, they approached me, and uh, it was basically trace evidence, which was what I considered my 
my strong suit and instrumental analysis. And so I, I got up there and then they said, oh, and, and by the way, your position is partially funded by the state fire marshal arson and bomb unit. So you are expected to give priority service to the investigators from arson and bomb. And I said, well, okay, I got a lot of background in those fields, so let's have it. Well, that turned out to be really good because I was, well, my first day, they said, well, at, at Sacramento, they said, well, we don't know particularly what you're going to be doing, but the state fire marshal is running a training uh, uh, symposium today in, in a town about 20 miles away. And so I spent the first day as a state employee helping make Molotov cocktails, <laughs> and fires and and uh, see what suppression was like and see what the evidence was like firsthand in full scale structure fires. Wow, wow. And that kind of set the course. I worked very uh, heavily with the guys from arson and bomb unit all over Northern California. And um, they were really strong believers in live fire training. And uh, a couple of us uh, joke that probably between the two or three of us, we'd probably burn 600 structures across Northern California in the, in the 15 years or so that, that I was participated. But that meant, you know, and somebody says, well, how do you know? You're just a physicist. How do you know how this happens? Well, I've been there, done that, seen it, took the pictures, wrote up the paper. And so that, you know, that's, that's a lot of information accumulated over a lot of years. So uh, very quickly, you became uh, the expert because you were developing everything right from from scratch. Um, yeah, I was I was using you know I had a pretty good equipment and uh, I was prepared to to use it uh, creatively and um, you know do the kind of rough and tumble stuff that's necessary sometimes in fire and explosion investigations. I responded to scenes occasionally and things like that. Um, and a lot of my colleagues didn't. And uh, in fact, nobody else really wanted to go near Trace. I was kind of a loner in the laboratory. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure my colleagues uh, sometimes like to refer to me as that, that uh, uh, individual <clears throat> back in the Trace lab. And don't mess with him because he's a nasty brute. <laughs> and by himself. So just leave him there. And so that... That worked out fine. They needed a trace evidence person, and but I, you know, I also did firearms and tool marks and shoe impressions and tires and okay. things like that. But they were nice to you because they wanted their evidence process first in their cases, right? Well, the <laughs> the staff was wasn't really nice. They just said, you know, well, that's a, that's Dehan's problem. Take it back to him. <laughs> okay. You know, we don't want to know you. <laughs> so from there, at the, that's the beginnings of your career, that launched you into some roles with some other agencies. And what was the next stage at, like for you then? Well, because of the, uh, accidentally because of the explosives work, um, it turned out when they started the pro, that program, there were three of us, one guy in Riverside Lab, one guy in Fresno Lab, and me in Sacramento. And our positions were partially funded by the state fire marshal, so we worked with them very closely. And uh, this official laboratory policy was we didn't do explosives cases. Well, this was the 1970s and early 80s before ATF had a laboratory in California. And so there wasn't anybody else to do it. So we would do it with the approval of our lab managers the policy was we just don't tell senior and management like the bureau chief never knew what we were doing back there. <laughs> and then, then when uh, they did open the laboratory, uh, the ATF lab, um, the new manager there, you know, was talking to his agents and said, well, who's been doing your explosives work? Oh, this guy in Sacramento. Who? And so I got a phone call from him saying, who the heck are you and what kind of training have you had? So, uh, we started off on kind of a rocky basis, but three or two years later, he recruited me and I went to work for ATF. Uh, and their laboratory at the time was on Treasure Island in the middle of San Francisco Bay. Huh. And, uh, and so that was challenging because there was only a handful of us and we covered 14 states uh, from Texas to Alaska 
and including Hawaii, although we never saw any cases from Hawaii. But uh, that was uh, challenging. And I only lasted there four years uh, because of the travel involved and uh, the stress and things like that of, you know, the phone rings at 5.30 in the morning saying, uh, the briefing is uh, today at six in Albuquerque or Houston or, you know, wherever else. And you go, okay, I'm on my way. And you didn't have any, <laughs> any options because there, were, there was one guy for backup in the specialty in the lab. And so it was you or him. And so that made it, that made it tough. And then, um, uh, but I got a lot of interesting cases. I think I, I think I lost track at about 400 uh, explosives and bomb cases in the uh, four years I was there. I was really busy and um, got to see a lot of interesting cases. And, and um, you know, somebody said, what was your most famous case? And I said, well, it was the Mormon church bomber, uh, Mark Hoffman in uh, Salt Lake City, who killed two people with bombs and then was on his way to kill a third one when the device went off in his lap. And that kind of got the attention of the authorities. And, yeah. and so he was ultimately uh, found guilty of uh, the murders and, and, uh, and stuff like that. But that was, that was what, 40 years ago, 30, well, yeah, uh, almost 40 years ago. Then um, as it turned out, the, the Bureau of Forensic Services, my state lab system uh, was starting a new uh, element, an independent uh, laboratory, basically, uh, designed to do research and specialized training and specialized case consulting. And they approached me, uh, much to my surprise, <laughs> after considering my <clears throat> not less than spectacular departure. And um, <laughs> they said, you know, you're the guy we want. And so that expanded the necessity to do a lot of training and I developed some really successful programs in fire debris analysis and explosive, low explosives analysis and things like that that are still in use today. And um, trained a lot of people and got to do some really interesting cases on a consulting basis. And not, not only in California, but uh, some cases across the country. And um, that lasted much to my surprise, 11 years. And um, then uh, I, I opted to retire and uh, start my own consultancy. That way I didn't have to keep a manager happy. Now, uh, during that stage, before you start your, uh, your consultancy, um, and probably some people watching this channel or listening to this podcast, because we're, we're putting the audio on a podcast as well, uh, they would know the answer to this. But other people are going to be watching or listening and, uh, because they're interested in the stories or the science, the technology, or, or different things. How, uh, what was it like for you compared to how things are portrayed in the movies or on television? Because you're talking about you get a call, you have to go to a briefing. Uh, so obviously the, the scene's probably already been investigated, and evidence collected, and is the briefing taking place in a meeting? Or, you know, just what does, what's the life of, that someone is living uh, really like? Well, um, probably 80% of your casework comes in over the front counter of the, uh, of the lab, uh, especially in trace evidence. And they, they've collected it. They've had an expert uh, crime scene investigator who's documented the scene and collected the evidence. We didn't do a lot of scene responses, probably maybe one in 15 or 20 uh, cases involved in actual scene response. Um, and, um, so you basically got a, 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 an investigative report and you talk, tried to talk to the investigator submitting the information and the evidence so that you got a clear picture of what was necessary. Sometimes offer guidance as to, you know, that what you're asking for isn't what you really need most. This is a, a better out, outcome for you, more critical information. And, um, so you'd kind of negotiate back and forth what was necessary. And then, um, and that sometimes, of course, depended on the resources of your laboratory or your personal knowledge. And um, that worked pretty well. Um, 
because they could come in and ask for anything and we could give them the, you know, the lowdown on what was acceptable and what wasn't. Um, the scene responses were, you know, okay. The, the first years at Alameda County, uh, big county, big population, except for the city of Oakland itself, which has its own police department forensic lab, a very good one. Uh, and, uh, but we covered the rest of the county, which was what, 300,000, 400,000 people. Um, but that included the sheriff's department submitting and 13, 12 or 13 cities, police departments. Um, so, you know, that was manageable. You got a phone call in the middle of the night and almost all your scenes were within an hour and a half drive or whatever. And some of them were, you know, literally across town. Um, and I, I lived in a fairly small town, what was then a fairly small town. And uh, some of them were at the other end of the county, but even that wasn't a big deal. Um, so in nighttime responses and you learn, you know, to take, take the proper gear and things like that because you were expected to cover the scene. And then I went to the state and at that time we covered 13 counties that laboratory counted uh, 13 counties across Northern California. Um, some of those scenes were, you know, three and four hours away by car. That was the only way to get there. And uh, then I went to work for ATF in 14 states. And so almost all the responses were, you know, uh, our, our, my participation uh, as a forensic scientist. Um, and ten, interestingly enough, I didn't qualify as a forensic chemist at LA, at, um, at, at uh, ATF uh, because my degree was in physics and that didn't include enough chemistry. So I was officially a physical scientist. And I remember when I, we had to, we had to pay for our own business cards and uh, my criminalist, my business cards with ATF logo on it said criminalist physical scientist. And my boss threw a fit and said, we don't have, we don't have criminalists in ATF. And I said, you do now. <laughs> and that kind of set the tone for <clears throat> our management employee relationships. In a little while, I want to talk about uh, some, uh, some of the stuff that you've got going on in your personal life, your cars and other hobbies. So um, uh, what I, and I think it qualifies you in my book as eccentric. So um, uh, eccentric in a good way, uh, not a, not eccentric <laughs> like all those people that you investigated and put in prison. Oh, uh, good. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, all right. So you get a call in the middle of the night. They're holding the scene. They're waiting you for, to show up. What do you pull up in? What are you driving? Well, <laughs> usually it was a state, you know, or, or county vehicle. Uh, the the first time I was called after I was hired by ATF, um, I got a call from the from the the uh, supervisor and he said, uh, well, you're officially not part of the team yet, but there's a, a national response team call out in the next town. I lived in Sacramento and there was a, a fire in uh, West Sacramento. And I said, oh, you know, I'll, I'll show up there in the morning and introduce myself to the team and, and, you know, see what their process was like. This was a national response team call out. So there were agents from all over, you know, well, especially trained agents from all over the West Coast. And then I realized that, well, my everyday car was um, in uh, the shop. And so I turned up at my first response in a 49 Bentley. <laughs> That's what I was wondering about. The James Young Sports Saloon I still own 40 years later. And, um, and so that kind of set the tenor for, you know, my relationship. They, all the agents looked at me and said, who the heck is this guy showing up in the Bentley? Now, for good effect, did you have like a trench coat or a certain hat or something that you showed up oh, into and stepped no, out? Or? No, my, you know, my usual equipment was a, was a uh, you know, coveralls and a, and a baseball hat. This was, <laughs> this was long before anybody realized what kind of health risks we were all taking. Yeah. And so, you know, you, they, we got gloves, we got work boots, um, and coveralls, and that was, that was considered enough. Uh, I knew enough chemistry that I thought, you know, this really isn't a good idea, but hey, we're all here and we're all breathing the same stuff. And so far, I haven't had any major complications from any of that. Well, that's good. But uh, yeah, that kind of set the tone. And then uh, curiously enough, several times when I was in, 
I was out with the national response team, uh, I'd be somewhere where a friend lived. And so I'd call them up and they'd, yeah, yeah, we'll come and get you. So I was in Portland and a friend showed up in a 1936 Bentley. <laughs> and then uh, I was in Marin County and the guy's wife came by in a new Thunderbird. And I didn't know it, but she had been drinking. And so we went to pull out of the, <laughs> the motel where the team was standing. Of course, everybody's standing around with a beer on the balcony of the hotel wondering, where's, you know, where's the Han going? And this beautiful lady shows up in this fancy car, and then she proceeds to drive around the parking lot and smack into the tire of an earth mover in the parking lot. And they go, yeah, Don's found another one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, that's, that was, you know, that was, that was kind of fun, but uh, you yeah. were a long way from home and, you know, the dogs were home and, you know, needing care and stuff like that. So you didn't tend to hang around much. So a lot of that changed when you started your own consultancy. So what, uh, what was that change like for you? Um, well, I could pick and choose the cases uh, that I, I wanted to do. Uh, I did both civil and criminal cases, which was a, you know, it's, it's a rarity. And I discovered, you know, how rare it was uh, when I, when I tried to get uh, errors and omissions insurance and none of the, companies that advertise in the, in the journals, um, their, one of their questions was, do you take criminal cases? And when I said, yes, they said, well, then we can't insure you. And, um, I thought that's kind of odd. And luckily I, I mentioned to, to a, a friend uh, from uh, ATF and he said, Oh, try this firm. And that firm only insured ex ATF agents. And I said, well, I was never an agent. Uh, I was a you know physical scientist, and they said close enough. <laughs> so I had really good um, you know or errors and omissions insurance uh, because of that that fluke. But um, I did, in in doing defense cases, obviously, you know, uh, you know what 30, 30 years, uh, well, yeah, twenty plus years that I was uh, in uh, in public sector stuff. I very rarely. Uh, testified for the defense, um, and but that wasn't by that wasn't by choice. It's you know my results were my results, and they went to the investigator or to the DA's office, and if they favored the defense, I often didn't hear anything more from the prosecutor or the or the detective. They just said, well, we can't we can't deal with that case, and so um, you don't have to be involved. But uh, there were one or two where uh, the defense insisted on having me there. And, and luckily, they, they got the attitude right or the understanding of my attitude about I'm a scientist. I'm following the science and you're getting my results, good, bad or indifferent to your case. And that is the, that was the motto when I started my own consultancy. I'd get these calls from prosecutors or investigators or public defenders and uh, sometimes high in uh, defense attorneys. And that was my policy. If you, if you, uh, you know, you submit the case, I'm following the science that I know best and you're going to have to live with the results. And I never had a public investigator, district attorney or private um, uh, uh, defense counsel or, or a, a public defender ever hesitate. They go, yep, that's what we want. We want to know, you know, the facts. And, uh, but you know who I never heard back from was the people calling on behalf of insurance companies. Hmm. Uh, I think in all the uh, 20 years I, I had my private consultancy, I bet I did less than five insurance company cases because they didn't want to take a chance on me coming along and saying, nope, that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't what happened or the evidence doesn't support that analysis or conclusion. So they didn't want to risk that. So I never heard from them again. Boy, there's so many things coming into my mind that I want to ask you, and we're going to cover uh, a lot of that, a lot of those things in future episodes. So uh, now you, uh, so you retired for work, from working for other people, and now you're retiring from working for yourself. Is that right? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, I think I only have three or four trailing cases. 
um, because you know, special well, criminal and civil cases can can drag on for years. And so I'm now looking at cases that that the fire or the explosion was in, you know, 2010 or 2012 or 2014 or whatever. And um, we're still waiting for you know the the courts to to help resolve those uh, those issues but almost all of them have have wrapped up um, I still have a hard time turning some cases down um, and because of the kind of unique nature of of my expertise that that I've accumulated over the past 50 years um, I, I know what the answer could be or at least at least I know what the the analysis should be like and um and they and i said but you know i'm retired i'm trying to get out of this business well who else has that knowledge and i go well nobody because <laughs> nobody was doing the same kind of strange stuff i was doing um and uh murder cases and and you know death incident fire death incidents and stuff like that and um so i brought a lot to bear and so i've gotten sucked into a couple of other, uh, in some cases, in some instances, major cases like the Grenfell Tower fire in London, um, where the Met Police recruited me. And uh, I said, I really don't want to get involved. You got all these great investigators. And he said, yeah, but you've got unique qualifications and you don't have a conflict of interest with any of the agencies <laughs> already involved. And I said, oh, okay, fine. You, you recently celebrated a birthday. I won't say how old you are, but it rhymes with 71. <laughs> <laughs> how uh now uh, uh, uh someone at 71 how how do you view the work or the cases or like you said there were some cases that you still find very interesting and that and compelling or that draw you into saying yes um how, what is it now that interests you uh at this point in your life that uh, maybe is different than uh maybe a couple decades ago well probably <laughs> Probably the ones involving uh, death and fire, uh, depending on the sequence, uh, fire after uh, death, uh, destruction of bodies, things like that. And because of the, the research um, that I was able to do as one of the instructors for the uh, Slow Fist Fire Death Investigation course, I got, a, I got the unique opportunity to see something like 60 human cadavers burn under controlled circumstances. And so I've got a lot of information that nobody else has as to what happens if you burn an adult human body under this condition, in this manner, for this duration. What can you expect? And understanding the fire dynamics and the effects on the body and what the body contributes and by the way of fuels and things like that. Um, it, it's hard to resist, you know, when somebody says, well, oh, and then it also includes the toxicology. What are people exposed to before they die? And sometimes you get, part of the problem is the pathologists that are sometimes involved in these uh, know a lot about the body and wounds and things like that, and the toxicology, but they don't know much about fire. And they're basing their conclusions on you know, what they learned in, in high school chemistry about fire or, you know, watching a fireplace or whatever it might be. And that knowledge is very limited. And, uh, I, you know, when, when somebody says, well, this is what so-and-so thinks or is going to, you know, prepare him to testify to, that's when I get really sucked in and um, say, yeah, okay. That's how I got involved in the Netflix making a murderer case. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so Stephen Avery called and said, uh, we want your help. We need your help. And I said, uh, I don't get Netflix. I don't know anything about your case. Oh, that's good. You, you if you didn't see it, you, then you won't have a bias. I'll send you the, <laughs> we'll send you the file. And I went, whoa, 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 it is this involved me. Oh, you wouldn't know. But the, you know, suspect, the perpetrator, uh, inserted the body of the victim. And, you know, we're looking at an appeal. Uh, and I thought, well, yeah, there aren't a lot of other people out there that have the knowledge I have about fires and bodies. And um, I was retained at the request 
at the strong suggestion, shall I say, of a colleague who's a forensic anthropologist who specializes in, in burned human remains. And I said, well, you got him involved. What do you need me for? He, he edited the textbook on burned human remains. Yeah, but you, you wrote the introductory chapter explaining all of it. And um, he's he, he says he's recovered a lot of burned bodies, but you've burned more bodies than he has. That's one of the episodes that I, I'm hoping that we will get to soon uh, because uh, I, I'm really interested in knowing not only more about your involvement in that case, but just generally principles involved in that. Um, you were unfamiliar with that case, but I can say it's Stephen Avery out of Manitowoc County. And for those of you watching this, if you want to skip ahead, uh, Dr. DeHaan is in part two, episode three. So, because <laughs> I've been following that very closely. So here, here, here you are um, towards the end of your career. And uh, so this YouTube channel and podcast, we're hoping uh, to, uh, for you to get some of your information and some of the things that you learn that you want to pass on to others out there. But you're also doing it through your involvement with a course on arson and explosion investigation that's uh, in cooperation with uh, Firewise Learning Academy. So do you want to tell us just a little bit about that course and your involvement in it? Yeah, that was, you know, I've done a lot of lecturing on a lot of different topics and, and over the last 45 years or so and, um, and, and getting involved in the training uh, for new investigators, especially, or upgrading, you know, experienced investigators. And uh, when I was offered the opportunity to get involved in this as basically introductory fire scene investigation, but it included all of the right elements that I thought is criti are critical to um, good investigative pro uh, processes. I agreed to be, you know, one of the technical advisors and and uh, play some small role in it. But uh, it's very promising as as a as a single unit um, presentation to get people off to a good start and following the the recommendations uh, of the nationally prescribed um, uh, guide, guides like NFPA 921 and 1033 and things like that. Yeah, I found it really interesting working with you on this. And of course, my role has been uh, narrating the course and putting it together and, and, and the website. But uh, as, uh, as we filmed some of your, uh, there, well, there are more than cameos in the course when you pop in and uh, are, are sharing on video. There's so many other things behind the scenes that you uh, reviewed and corrected or made advice for. And yeah, so you were a really significant uh, part of that, of that course. So I, I, I'm, I'm not a fire investigator. Uh, I'm not a fire starter, but I found it very interesting. Uh, <laughs> but you know, you're after all that work and all that, all that, you know, skill applied, you're fully qualified. So, you know, get out there with a shovel. Fully qualified to start fires or to investigate them? No, to investigate. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, I tend, you know, that's, that's the interesting thing. Somebody said once, 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 uh, I, I think it was in court, they said, gee, must have had a really interesting childhood. And I said, no, I didn't set any fires until the day I went to work for the state of California. I said, I, you know, I build electron accelerators and, and irradiated the neighbor's cat and things like that. And, uh, <laughs> and that's when they go, oh, okay, you know, okay. one of these boy scientists, you know, we're going to avoid going there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I didn't do, I, I, you know, I didn't do any fire stuff as a, as a kid. Uh, even firecrackers, I had minimal exposure. Well, one of my big takeaways from um, narrating that course and learning so much in it was that uh, I am not smart enough to get away with setting a fire. I think like many people just growing up, and that's why you see people doing it to cover their crimes, you think, oh, I'll set a fire and it will just destroy all the evidence and no one will be able to find anything. And uh, definitely this course uh, really opened my eyes to seeing the fact that, oh no, if you set a fire, you're not necessarily destroying everything. In fact, you may very well be doing things that will help you get caught for doing it. So as always, it's better just not to do the crime in the first place. Uh, but so we'll be covering much more of that. So tell us about your cars. How many cars do you have? You've got, uh, you've got the Bentley. I think you've got a, a Shelby as well, right? I'm not, I'm not sure as to the final count. I'm always surprised when I, you know, when somebody says, well, tally them up for us. And you go, oh. I think there's 16 uh, cars. I started restoring cars as uh, when I was in college, 
as a sanity preserver. I restored a 1928 Essex sedan uh, that I bought for $400. Um, and uh, I restored it myself with, with my mother doing the upholstery and stuff like that. And, uh, but I had to sell that to move to California to take my first job. And uh, it's so screwed with my mind to sell the car that uh, I thought, well, I'm not going to do that again. So let's see, five months later, um, I had uh, purchased the remains of a 55 MG TF race car. And uh, a month after that, I took delivery of the three liter Bentley, the 27 Bentley that I, in fact, I still own both of them. And a couple of months after that, I took delivery of a 69 El Camino that I also still have. And because I just, you know, I love these cars and I can't part with them. So they just kind of accumulate. There's no sense or rhyme or reason. I own three Bentleys, uh, 27, a 49, and a 90. I own four Hudson products, a 23 Essex race car and a, um, a Terraplane from the 30s and a Hudson Hornet and a Railton, which was a Hudson hybrid from England. And, um, you know, the MG is still here, uh, XK120 Jaguar, um, a Lotus Elan. And then we get into the American stuff. And I have a, I, I bought a, the remains of a burned, um, stolen and stripped uh, Shelby GT350 Mustang. What, I restored that. What year is that car? That's a 1966 66, Shelby. okay. Was that a crime you investigated or you just found out oh, about no, the car? No, a friend of, a car friend of mine ran a, ran a uh, tow service and he called me and he said, I just, I just dragged off the remains of a, of a Shelby, a real Shelby that uh, some airman at uh, Travis Air Force Base, it was stolen and stripped and burned. And he said, I just dragged it off to the junkyard. So, you know, it's, it's available for salvage. So I bought this wreck. Um, and spent four years uh, putting it back together. So it's now correct with the, not the correct engine, but a correct engine and gearbox and interior and engine parts and suspension and stuff like that. So it's now registered as, it always has been registered as a Shelby. And, and besides the crash, did you determine what the cause of the fire was? Oh, it was it was arson. They had they had oh. stripped the they had stripped the car. Oh, I thought that I thought it would from a crash. Oh no, he no, it was uh, uh, stripped. There was no engine gearbox, um, and um, but it the passenger compartment back was completely burned. <laughs> and then to make it worse, uh, it apparently spent its early years in Colorado, and so it was very badly rusted. Uh, what didn't get burned was badly rusted. So that was an interesting challenge. Uh, that's why it took me four years to restore it, but it's, it's back. Well, we may have to do a whole episode on uh, all of your cars, cars. Uh, but uh, I better cut you off there. Uh, uh, now, I will say, I know you and I share another hobby in common, and that is model railroading. We're, we're, we're train buffs. I'm not even going to start on that because that'll be another 15 minutes because uh, you won't it be able to stop it yourself. Has, it, it has a lot of aspects in common with the cars. Most of the stuff is old, and but most of it runs. I guess that's one of the one of the most exceptions. Well, you and I could nerd out on that for a long time. So one last thing, uh, tell us about your dogs. Ah, uh, yes. Well, for most of the last fifty years, I've owned uh, at least one Irish Wolfhound, and uh, they're marvelous animals and uh, friendly. Um, very outgoing, which is sometimes <laughs> a problem because people aren't used to 150 pound dogs that are, you know, kind of look them in the eye. If you're, if you're five, two or five, five or something like that, kind of gunners or one of the big boys is looking at you almost face to face. Um, but they're such splendid dogs. And, uh, the bad news is they, they don't live very long, seven to nine years, like most giant breeds. And so when I lost a couple of wolfhounds back to back, I got into, um, actually thanks to a wolfhound person, um, that um, I started getting rescue greyhounds, racing retired racers, and they're marvelous dogs, and uh, almost the same kind of personality as a wolfhound, uh, you know, different intent in life, um, and wolfhounds were used in battle, and greyhounds were used to chase rabbits, and so... 
you know, kind of a different attitude about life in general, but um, they're, they're wonderful dogs. Now, did you ever show up to a crime scene, step out of the Bentley with the wolfhound? No. Oh, uh, see, now that would have been classic. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dr. Dahan, I'm really excited about uh, this channel and the podcast. Uh, I always enjoy the times that we uh, have talked together, uh, not only when you were uh, here in my city a year ago and we were working on the course, but also now just through these connections that I, I really enjoy. I'm excited. I hope that everybody else is excited too. So uh, thanks for sharing about your life in this. Thanks for this opportunity to do this channel with you. Oh, well, my pleasure. Great having a nice chat with y'all. Thanks for tuning in to the first episode of The Han on Fire, brought to you by Firewise Learning Academy. We look forward to bringing you many more episodes here on this channel or in this podcast. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel and ring that bell to get notifications of new uploads to the channel. You don't have to wait very long for new content because we've already uploaded episode number two, which answers a current question, do cigarettes still cause fires? Thank you for watching and tuning in. Until next time, I'm Tim Davis for Firewise Learning Academy and The Han on Fire.